Swift, a programming language created at Apple, is by most measures one of the top 10 most popular programming languages in the world. It came out just seven years ago, which in the lifetime of programming languages is not that long ago. Today we'll get into how it's become so popular and what's special about the Swift language. Welcome to Copec Explained Software, the podcast where we make computing intelligible. Dave, let's start at the beginning. When was Swift developed and who created it? Swift was originally created by Chris Ladner. Chris Ladner is a very highly regarded computer scientist. He did his PhD on compilers, and of course Swift being a programming language has to have a compiler, so it's pretty natural that he ended up developing a programming language. He first came to the attention of the computing world for developing a lot of the beginnings of the LLVM compiler system. LLVM is worked on by Apple, by Microsoft, by NVIDIA. It's become an industry standard compiler. Apple hired him after he finished his PhD to keep working on LLVM, and eventually he became high up in their DevTools organization. So he's working on DevTools at Apple, and Apple is tied to an older programming language that we talked about on a previous episode that I'll link to in the show notes called Objective-C. And Apple was starting to look for a replacement for Objective-C. And Chris Latner was kind of as a side project developing a new language that he had big hopes for, big dreams for, and that was Swift. And he started that in 2010. Apple made it public in 2014 and announced it as basically the future of programming on their platforms. Why did Apple make the switch to Swift? As we talked about on that prior episode about Objective-C, there were some serious concerns about Objective-C. One, which is really just skin deep, is that the syntax kind of turned off some developers. So there were proposals within Apple to actually just improve the syntax of Objective-C, but there was another problem with Objective-C. The other problem with Objective-C, as we talked about on that prior episode, is that Objective-C is a superset of the C programming language, which we also talked about on a prior episode, which I'll link to in the show notes on the C programming language. Anyway, C is an unsafe language. It's one of the most widely used programming languages in the world, but it's an unsafe language. It allows programmers to shoot themselves in the foot. Apple wanted a language that had, I don't want to quite say training wheels on, but it had safety features in place to stop programmers from hurting themselves. That's one of the major things that's emphasized in Swift is safety. It's much harder to create certain kinds of programmer errors in a Swift program than it is in an Objective-C program. So basically, Apple wanted something that was more modern, something that was safer, and something that had more attractive syntax to more developers. Is Swift only used by Apple programmers, or is it used for other things too? Yeah, as you can imagine, for something that came out of Apple, Apple really controls Swift. It is an open source language. When it first came out, the implementation, the compiler were not open source. When it first came out in 2014, it was proprietary to Apple, but they promised, they said, in the future, we will open source it. And they did open source it in 2016. Once they open sourced Swift, there did start to be more community involvement. And they even have a way for community members to get involved in the development of Swift. They also have a way for community members to go and propose new features for the language or new features for the standard library. So there's definitely community involvement in the language. That said, Apple still really steers it. Apple still really controls it. And it's really only widely used for developing apps on Apple platforms. So developing apps for Mac OS or iOS or watch OS or iPad OS. Outside of that, there's been attempts to use it in other places. For example, After Chris Latner left Apple, he briefly worked at Tesla, but then he went and worked at Google for a couple years and was actually working on porting a major machine learning library called TensorFlow to Swift. However, Google eventually abandoned that work and he actually moved on himself and now he works at a microprocessor company that's developing RISC-V microprocessors, but that's a topic for another episode. Anyway, so so Google was kind of working with Swift on maybe having TensorFlow be with Swift. IBM actually got pretty invested in Swift, and they developed a web backend framework called Ketora for Swift. 
but they actually abandoned that like a year or two ago and they sent it over to the community to continue developing it. There has been some other pretty popular frameworks for the Swift world, not popular in general, but popular for the Swift world for developing backend web applications. One of them is called Vapor. Another one is called Perfect. So there's been a little bit of use of Swift for backend web stuff. There's been a little bit of use of Swift on Linux. There's a little bit of use of Swift on Windows. At least the compiler and the language runtime have been ported to both Linux and Windows and now are officially supported by Apple as ports. But the thing is, they're just not widely being used out there. Really, Swift is mainly used, we would say probably 98% of the people who use Swift use it to develop apps for Apple platforms. What's it like to program in Swift? It is a very modern language. It does have a lot of good ideas from multiple different places. You'll see parts of it that are inspired by Python. You'll see parts of it that are inspired by things from C++. You'll see parts of it that are inspired by Objective-C, of course, because Objective-C is kind of its predecessor. And there's some anachronisms that it actually inherited from Objective-C. Swift had to be backwards compatible with Objective-C because there needed to be an easy transition for Objective-C programmers to start becoming Swift programmers. And of course, Apple has all of its old software built in Objective-C, all of these big frameworks like AppKit and UIKit that underlie all the apps on Apple's platforms are built in Objective-C. And so Swift had to have backwards compatibility with Objective-C. So you see a lot of Objective-C influence in there as well. In a previous episode called What is a Programming Language, we talked about different paradigms of programming languages. Swift is actually on the boundary between several of them. It includes definitely object-oriented programming facilities, but it also has a lot of parts of it that are inspired by functional programming languages. And then there's even a part of Swift that has kind of its own paradigm called protocol-oriented programming. And I think getting into the details of what protocol-oriented programming is, is a little beyond the scope of our episode today. But it's interesting that it has all these different paradigms. We definitely call Swift a multi-paradigm language, similar to how C++ is a multi-paradigm language, which we talked about on our prior episode about C++. We've done a lot of these programming language episodes now. Anyway, so it's a multi-paradigm language that has influences from a lot of previous languages, and it definitely has a very modern syntax. I would say that the ethos of Swift is to have what's called progressive disclosure. The idea is that when you're first learning it, it's easy to get started, and you don't need to know all of the features of the language to start being productive in it. And as you want to learn more, you can disclose more and more and more and unravel more and more and get to more of the complicated features of the language. It is also a very big language, and some people call that like a kitchen sink language. It just has a ton of different features, and they keep adding features and new releases of the language. So that is actually has its pros and cons. Some people like to have a smaller programming language where they can really keep the whole thing in their mind. And so Swift is definitely not that. At the same time, it also means that there are facilities in place that allow you to do some advanced things that would be harder to do in some simpler languages. So it has facilities for all kinds of interesting applications and interesting use cases. But it's a very big language, and they keep it keeps getting bigger and it keeps getting bigger. And I'd actually say that's one of my main criticisms with it. I think that it's trying to be too many things to too many different kinds of programmers. And I think what it's really mainly used for is building apps for Apple platforms. So that should really be where most of the focus is on features for the language. But I think maybe the language designers have a bit of design by committee going on where there's not just one person as there originally was when Chris Latner was developing the language that had this real vision and focus. And it's become just this amalgamation of different people's ideas. And the language has gotten a little bit fat, for lack of a better word, just big in a way that um, is a little bit unwieldy. Where do you see Swift going in the future? Well, like I mentioned, they keep adding major features to the language. Most recently, they added some facilities for asynchronous programming, similar to async await in JavaScript or Python, but they also added the actor model from Erlang. For people who don't know what I'm talking about right now, basically they made it easier to use Swift for programming in the world of concurrency, where we're trying to do multiple things at the same time or multiple things out of order, etc. Uh, so they recent, that's a big change to the language, and we'll kind of see how that plays out over the next couple of years. There's also talk about adding some more 
of what's called an ownership model to language. And some of the inspiration for this might come from the Rust programming language, which is a contemporary of Swift, came out around the same time, is also taking some mind share from some older languages. And the idea is to have more fine-grained control of who owns various pieces of memory as a program executes and ensuring that the memory is safely passed around and uh, that it's not used in ways that could lead to errors or exceptions as a program runs. That's actually a feature that would make the language even safer. The language has a lot of safety facilities built in, and that's actually something that I should have mentioned earlier also sometimes frustrates people about the language. It, it definitely sometimes feels like there's some training wheels on, and you have to go out of your way to kind of take those training wheels off if you want to do something that's lower level. The language claims to try to be as performant as the C family of languages, or almost as performant. When they first released it, Apple called it Objective-C without the C. The reality is that because of all the safety features, it's unlikely Swift will ever be quite as performant for all applications as C or C++, no matter how advanced the tooling gets or how advanced the compiler gets, because there is a certain cost to just having some of those safety features. At the same time, it's still an order of magnitude faster than a language like Python or a language like Ruby that is an interpreted language. So it's still in that family of compiled languages, still in that family of native code generated languages, still in that family of languages that can be used for high performance applications. I've gone on a little bit of a tangent, but basically I think that they are gonna continue to add more safety features to the language. I think if I were them, I would spend some more time working on making certain parts of the language a little bit more ergonomic. Things like the string API is a constant frustration for people learning Swift. Strings, as you know, if you listen to some of our prior episodes, are basically text in programs, and basically every program needs to work with a lot of text. And some programming languages, unfortunately, make that unnecessarily difficult. And Swift is one of them, um, where this, the handling strings, handling text, basically, in the language is much more obtuse than it needs to be. So if I was in charge, I would stop just continually adding so many major new features to the language, and I would work on refining some of the basics that I think they still haven't gotten right. One thing I will say about the language and about its future is that it's certainly stabilized. One thing it was criticized a lot for during the first few years when it was released was that it was changing too much. So somebody had their code written and then their code would stop being able to be compiled with a new version of the language. That really stabilized a few years ago, and now there's really what's called source-level compatibility for the most part from one version of the language to the next version of the language, meaning that you don't need to go change your code after a new version of the language comes out. So that really has alleviated itself, and I don't see that getting any worse going forward because they really have gotten to a point where it is widely used, I mentioned at the beginning of the episode that by many measures, it's one of the top 10 languages in the world now. Well, once you get to that big a user base, you need to then have a lot more responsibility about managing people's code bases. You can't go breaking their code when people have built so much code with your language. I do see the language having more stability as we go forward. Unfortunately, I do see them continually adding more and more features, making the language more and more complicated, and that would be my kind of critique of where they've been going the last couple of years and where it seems like they're going. Do you see it growing more and getting used outside of Apple platforms like on Linux or Microsoft? Well, they have been making efforts. For example, the Windows port finally got like officially supported status from them. I think it was a year ago. It might have now been two years ago. So they're definitely making efforts in that regard. But I don't think it's going to be enough personally. The reason being, it's a very competitive language landscape right now. You have a lot of new languages that are just coming to the forefront. I mentioned earlier in the episode Rust. Rust is definitely a competitor to Swift for low-level applications, which was something that originally Swift was envisioned for by Chris Latner. He wanted to see the language used for like everything, everything from low-level to high-level applications. But it has, a, it has a competitor in Rust for low-level applications. On the high level, it has a competitor in Kotlin, which has really become the main language in the Android world. Kind of Kotlin is to Java in the Android world, as Swift is to Objective-C in the iOS and Mac OS world. So there's all these competing languages that are also getting a lot of mind share, getting a lot of attention. And I don't know that Swift itself is that much better 
than these other languages for it really to completely break out of the Apple niche. And so, unfortunately, even though I was a pretty big enthusiast of the language at the beginning, I even have a book that I wrote in the language, um, over time, my enthusiasm for the language has really decreased. One, because I do think they've taken in too many different directions. But two, I'm not sure that it really has enough momentum and enough compelling differentiators to make it compelling for people on let's say, the Android world, the Windows world, the Linux world. Um, so I think, unfortunately for them, their, their future, and maybe Apple's okay with this, it will be pretty limited to Apple platforms. All right, thanks for listening to us this week. Rebecca, how can people get in touch with us on Twitter? We're at Kopec Explains, K-O-P-E-C-E-X-P-L-A-I-N-S. Have a great week. Thanks for listening.